Hello, everyone, and welcome to the FAA Forum. This morning's program will be about the me medicine, aerospace medicine that's going on in the updates. Our speaker today was a Navy air surgeon. He served on the Theodore Roosevelt. And today he's stationed in Washington. And Mr. Dr. James Fraser is the Deputy Federal Air Surgeon. So please welcome Dr. James Fraser. All right. Well, good morning. Um, it is a pleasure to uh, be here from Washington, D.C. I can uh, tell you it took a while for winter to start. We had a warm December, and, and uh, in the beginning of uh, January, it was somewhat warm, but we've had a definite winter ever since. So it, it was not spring yet when I left, and it's a pleasure to be down here in Florida. Uh, this is my first time at Sun and Fun, and I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I am uh, James Fraser. I am the Deputy Federal Air Surgeon, and today I'd uh, like to uh, do three things. I'd like to start off by spending just a couple of minutes telling you a little bit about my background so you know where I'm coming from. And then I'd like to talk about some of the programs that we have in aerospace medicine and particularly how we at headquarters play in these programs. And then lastly, I'd like to talk about some of the uh, current issues that we have in aerospace medicine and certainly open it up to any questions that you might have. Uh, fortunately, I am joined by my colleague up front, Dr. Richard Carter, who is here working the booth for uh, FAA Aerospace Medicine and has helped some 60 or 70 odd airmen here at Sun and Fun with particular medical questions about their particular case. And uh, since, since Richard works at the Aeromedical Certification Division at CAMI in Oklahoma City. If there's any uh, particulars about certification that come up during the question and answer session, uh, Richard's here to help me out. So I appreciate you uh, coming in, Richard. Um, I will start by just uh, telling you a little bit about my own background. I've not been with the FAA as long as a lot of my colleagues. Uh, I, I joined the FAA about three and a half years ago after the uh, Navy sent me a letter telling me that 30 years of fun was all the time a sailor was allowed to have. So um, at that time I was fortunate to uh, be able to apply to a position at headquarters with the FAA and I couldn't be happier to be where I'm at and to be doing what I'm doing. Uh, I'm not new to aerospace medicine. I've been doing that a long time. Uh, as far as my Navy career is concerned, I started out life as a Mark I Mod Zero family physician and after residency and, and, uh, and working as a staff family physician teaching family medicine. I uh, went overseas to first the Philippines for three years and Scotland for three years and was able to take my family and had a great time overseas and learned a lot about family medicine, uh, but I had always wanted to be a naval flight surgeon. So before I got too old, I was able to apply to the uh, naval flight surgeon program and, and subsequently went to Pensacola, Florida, where uh, they taught me to fly an airplane. I no longer had call every other night, and because they started giving me flight pay, I got a pay raise. So what a deal. I uh, have been in aerospace medicine ever since. I um, stuck around in Pensacola and did, did a second residency in uh, aerospace medicine. Following that, uh, I did what a lot of uh, aerospace medicine specialists do in the Navy. I went to be a senior medical officer on one of our nuclear aircraft carriers, the USS Theodore Roosevelt, which was, uh, which was an honor. And, a, uh, and some of my best sea stories uh, come from my time on the carrier and the adventures thereon. So if you don't have any questions, I can always tell sea stories. Uh, following my time on the Roosevelt, I uh, stayed on the East Coast and, and joined Commander Naval Air Force Atlantic Fleet, where I had oversight of, of what was then seven aircraft carriers on the East Coast and, and their medical departments as well as all the naval flight surgeons and physicians working in the Atlantic fleet. 
Uh, and then my, my final seven years in the Navy was, uh, was, was still in Norfolk, Virginia, where I was at the Naval Safety Center. And as the Naval Safety Center surgeon, I had the opportunity to train all Naval Flight Surgeons. I uh, had the opportunity to work with the highest, the highest levels of, uh, of Naval Aviation in terms of lots of safety initiatives to make Navy and Marine Corps aviation safer. Uh, and, and I uh, had the opportunity to participate in all the Navy Marine Corps fatal mishaps. And uh, I, I, in fact, ended my career in the Navy by being invited to be a, a member of the, of the Columbia Accident Investigation Board, or what we called the, called the CABE. So got to spend uh, three and a half months at Houston before, uh, before I went home. But as I, as I said in the beginning, the, uh, the Navy did send me a letter, and I was very fortunate to be able to apply for a position at uh, headquarters and uh, started there as manager medical specialties and now for over just for just over a year I've been the deputy federal air surgeon. So I want to talk a, a little bit about the uh, programs that we have in, in aerospace medicine and then we'll get into uh, some of the current issues and some of the good news stories, at least I consider them good news stories that I'm anxious to share with you. Um, aerospace medicine is part of aviation safety. We are the third largest service. Of course, the big, the, the big gorilla is flight standards, which comprises some 6,000 plus personnel, and then aircraft certification, which is a couple of thousand, and then we are a very distant third with some 330 FAA personnel scattered in nine regions all across the country and at CAMI. Now, despite the fact that we're the, only the third and a distant third in terms of size, uh, we do have the largest number of designees. And as, as many of you know, and I'm, as I'm sure some of you probably are, aviation medical examiners. So we have a very robust program where we train aviation medical examiners that act as our agents to medically certificate airmen all over the world. Um, we are the appellate level of aircraft medical certification. Oh, and before I go on to that, I, could, I want to just say that, uh, that not only do we develop standards for airmen and air traffic controllers, one of the really interesting things that I get to be involved with at headquarters is the development of standards for commercial space flight crew and passengers. Uh, that could be a lecture in and of itself, as could the development of standards for UAV operators. Uh, UAVs, as you know, are, are becoming uh, far more common in this country. There's UAVs flying in our airspace as we speak. And what constitute a medical certification for a UAV operator is also a lecture in and of itself i.e., what is a UAV, anything from a model airplane to something as large as a, as a standard air carrier. Uh, and, and how much control does the UAV operator have over the flight services? I mean, some flight surfaces, some of the uh, operators uh, have to have the dexterity and skills of, of a pilot, and more so, and then other UAV operators have nothing more to do than go turn on a switch. So there's a, so there's a great deal of discussion that's been fun to participate with in terms of how we medically certificate UAV operators and we get into such things as uh, psychological testing and how do you drug test these folks or do you drug test these folks. And we, we certainly at headquarters uh, spend a great deal of time in developing policy and standards. Um, we do serve as the appellate level or the final level in aircraft or airman medical certification. 
if an AME defers an airman to AMCD in Oklahoma City, and then if AMCD does not uh, certificate that airman, every airman has the right to appeal to the federal air surgeon, in which case the, uh, the, the case comes up to us in Washington, and we look very closely at these very complex, I mean, by the time it's been vetted through the AMEs and through CAMI, uh, we know we have very complex medical and psychiatric cases, but we look at these very closely. Uh, I can tell you, even though our first mission in the FAA is to make sure that we maintain the national airspace and keep it safe. A very close second is our efforts to get every airman that we, that we can up and flying. We work very hard to, uh, to, to see if we think an airman is safe uh, not for the career like we did in the Navy or you would do in the military, but for the period of their medical certificate, so six months, one year, two, three, or five years for, three, for third class. And if we think that airman can safely fly, we'll get him up. And in fact, uh, I am very proud of the fact that if, if you work with us in aerospace medicine, even if you have a very serious medical or, or psychiatric issue, uh, we're probably going to get you up in the air. If you look at the numbers, only one-tenth of one percent of airmen are ultimately final denied. Now, there, there is something under just ten percent that may be deferred by their aviation medical examiner, and then it goes to AMCD, and we may need more information. We may need to uh, authorize what we call a special issuance, whereby we will require that airman to periodically get special testing and, and will we'll condition his medical certificate of him continuing that medical testing. But having done so, only one-tenth of one percent of all airmen that apply to us are ultimately denied. And uh, I'm very proud of the fact that we get so many folks up in the air as we do. We, uh, we, the FAA, serve as a gold standard or a benchmark for the rest of the world. And I can tell you that, that many of the certificating authorities uh, from, from the rest of the world are, are uh, sometimes amazed at our willingness to authorize such things as diabetics that use insulin to fly airplanes. Certainly very few countries in the world uh, would allow such things as that. Um, so in Washington we work hard. We use, we use, uh, we do a lot of uh, literature review and we use the best of, of what we call evidence-based medicine to determine what can and, and cannot be uh, safe when you fly an aircraft. And we are, we are not afraid to certificate uh, a, a number of things, and we'll touch on some of those in just a moment. We uh, play big in occupational health in terms of development of policy. And I can tell you, being at uh, Washington, D.C., it's very interesting. We work with uh, NIH and CDC and the Department of Homeland Security, and we work on how we would handle communicable disease like tuberculosis or SARS. We work with how we would handle emerging disease like avian flu. Uh, we work with how we would handle bioterrorism agents. And it's quite an, an interesting world to uh, talk with these various other agencies and develop plans as, as to how we in the FAA in aerospace medicine would interact with these agencies in event of communicable disease, emerging diseases, or bioterrorism. We also do the more mundane things like decide which size aircraft need to carry AEDs 
automatic external defibrillators, and all of you need to help me between my Navy acronyms and my medical acronyms. If I start talking in tongues, please, please raise your hand and stop me, and I'll slow down and, and uh, try to be plain spoken. But we determine how big a plane needs an AED. We determine which plane needs medical kits and what goes into those medical kits, how many first aid kits you need, and things of that nature. In aerospace medicine, we, are, uh, we have a big role in the substance abuse, substance dependence world. Uh, we run the industry substance abatement program, and as such, we have a, have a very robust program whereby we test uh, pilots and maintainers of commercial aircraft um, and we inspect those air carriers or those maintenance entities to make sure that they have the appropriate drug programs and we want to make sure our commercial pilots and maintainers aren't on drugs when they're taking you from point A to point B. We also have our own internal substance abuse program whereby we drug test all of the safety and security sensitive personnel, which is mostly air traffic controllers, but uh, we, we also maintain our own internal program. And finally, um, I'm very proud that the FAA is, is once again a world benchmark in terms of developing a HIMSS program, and HIMSS is Human Intervention Model uh, but basically, it's a program that some of you may be familiar with whereby commercial pilots can work with uh, the union, can work with the FAA, and, and once diagnosed or identified as a substance-dependent person, can be rehabilitated and can be brought back into a career as an air transport pilot. Uh, we, have, we have been able to um, identify uh, thousands, literally thousands, over the 20 years that we've been a part of this HEMS program, uh, commercial pilots and rehabilitate them and bring them back to active lives as, as air transport pilots and husbands and fathers and and, and uh, we continue to play a, a big role in working to make sure that we identify these kind of folks and offer the kind of services they need. <clears throat> we play a big role in aeromedical education. I think I touched on that. Um, I think there's something like 3,500 aviation medical examiners scattered all, all over the world. So we hold regular uh, seminars where we train doctors that want to become aviation medical examiners. We also have required refresher training for these AMEs that we provide all over the country. Um, and we also train airmen. Uh, we're, we uh, like to come to venues such as Sun and Fun or Oshkosh and other air shows and fly-ins and have been able to provide uh, regular physiologic training to thousands of airmen. And lastly, I'll mention uh, research. <clears throat> we play a big role in terms of aeromedical research, uh, both at CAMI and, and beyond. At CAMI, we have both human factors research, where we look into such things as fatigue issues for not only pilots, but flight attendants, and for air traffic controllers. We look into such things as how important color vision is for pilots and for air traffic controllers. And we, we learned some interesting things. I, um, you know, we now have some very sophisticated screens that controllers use that have many colors. And technologically, you can, you can create dozens of different colors. And we know from scientific studies that color can be a useful tool in terms of making important information on a chart more readily available. But despite the fact that we have the capability to technologically create dozens of colors, we've learned that the human brain can really only process about five or six of those colors in an expeditious manner. 
So we continue to learn new and interesting things about how important color vision is for, uh, for people in aviation. Uh, we also do a lot of the, uh, the aeromedical research in terms of crash survival and, and evacuation plans and systems and how people evacuate into water and survive. Uh, we look into crash-worthy seats. We do a lot of research in the chamber, uh, looking at the hypobaric environment, hypoxic environment. So there's a lot of great research that's done at CAMI. Some of that research you may have read about. Uh, some, of that, some of our own research uh, was recently quoted by uh, Congressman Oberstar, who is uh, chairman of the House Transportation and Infrastructure, which is what the Aviation Subcommittee falls under. But uh, Congressman Oberstar used one of our own studies that was done uh, from work that is the result of having our toxicology laboratory. We have a world-class toxicology laboratory whereby if there's a fatal mishap, uh, we have tissue samples and, and basically can determine uh, amazing things, not the least of which is what medications or what medical conditions the fatal, uh, that the pilot may have had in the case of a fatal accident. And we, in order to do the typical quality assurance that is required to maintain our status as a world-class tox laboratory, we, we looked at the Airman's 8500 TAC-8s to look and see what medications or medical conditions they had listed on their, on their medical in order to corroborate the fact that our laboratory picked up what they said they had or the medication they were taking. And we found that, that our laboratory was indeed good. If they had a given medical condition, we were pretty doggone good at, at determining that during toxicology. If they were taking medicine, it was certainly easy to corroborate the fact that they were taking that medicine. But what we learned is that there were 8% or so of airmen that had a medical condition or were taking a medication that they didn't put on their 8500 TAC-8. So in, 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 in the concept that no good deed goes unpunished, Congressman Oberstar quoted our own study and uh, we soon get to participate in congressional hearings, uh, another joy of being in the D.C. area, um, whereby we will, we will be able to dis discuss this with uh, Congressman Oberstar and other members of the committee. We, the FAA, Aerospace Medicine, don't think that falsification of the 8500 TAC-8s is a huge issue. Certainly it happens, certainly it can potentially be a problem, but to have to use the resources to match databases as Congressman Oberstar has suggested uh, we think perhaps might not be the best bang for the buck. So we are anxious to engage in that conversation um, and more to follow. Okay, let me talk about some of the, uh, some of the th decisions that have been reached, some of the recent changes that have been made uh, that are examples of how we are using the best of evidence-based medicine to allow airmen to fly with medical conditions that were once thought incompatible with aviation. Uh, multifocal lenses. Um, for, for those of us that have reached 45 or 50 and beyond and we suddenly find that our arms aren't quite long enough, you have a choice. You can either get bifocals, which of course you have to carry and carry an extra pair in your aircraft, or the, we now have uh, new multifocal lenses whereby if, if you are interested in having the surgery, you can have a multifocal lens put in and you'll never have to wear bifocals. Uh, you'll you'll um, do this for reasons of cataracts or perhaps vanity, but whatever the case, there are 
there's enough literature out there that shows us that if you do want to have one of these multifocal lenses, uh, or it would have to be bilateral, but if you have multifocal lenses implanted surgically, we'll allow you to get your medical certificate. And that would be a regular certificate, it's not a special issuance. We have developed in the past couple of years dozens of what we call uh, AASI, AME Assisted Special Issuances. And I know Richard participates in certification of lots of AASIs or Quick Cert as some people call them, but we have taken incredibly complex medical conditions like myocardial infarctions or heart attacks and subsequent uh, percutaneous uh, transluminal angioplasty or stenting or even coronary artery bypass grafting, serious diseases of this nature and, and other diseases like aortic valve replacement or mitral valve replacement, uh, the, the various dysrhythmias like atrial fibrillation, which is very common in an aging population, cancers, uh, be, it, be it breast cancer, prostate cancer, bladder cancer, you name it, we have developed protocols whereby an airman that has one of these 35, I think it is, Richard, 35 give or take conditions, serious medical conditions that were once permanently disqualifying, we now allow these airmen to submit the information, the required information to AMCD, and AMCD will issue a special issuance with a six-year authorization whereby Following that first authorization at CAMI, that airman can then go back to his AME. He can provide the annual uh, report from his cardiologist or from his, his uh, hematologist or whatever the case might be and, and required testing depending on the condition. But the airman can take this information back to his AME and then without going to the hassle and, and sometimes delay of submitting all that stuff back to Oklahoma City, the AME then gives the airman a new medical certificate right then and right there and, it's, uh, and the airman walks out the door good to go for another year or two depending on the condition and once again uh, is only required to get the current status report and whatever testing is directed and give that to the AME in the period specified. So we are very happy with the fact that we've got lots of AMEs out there that are helping us do this. Uh, there are some AMEs that are still unfamiliar with reading a, a stress test or uh, evaluating some of the required information we require, but it's catching on and, and certainly if you were to have a condition of this nature it is not hard for you to find an AME that's willing to participate in these AME assisted special issuances and it would make your life uh, much easier. Uh, another, another example of, uh, of a state-of-the-art change is heart transplants. We are now uh, giving special issuances to people that have had a heart transplant and that's not everyone that's had a heart transplant because you could still have lots of, lots of problems. Um, we once upon a time did authorize heart transplants, but we learned that uh, people that had transplants had a nasty habit of, of uh, dying suddenly, uh, and, and we reversed that. But now, following the work of, of many cardiac surgeons, we have successfully identified a subset, a subset of those people that have had heart transplants that we are able to safely certificate. And the same thing goes true for hypertrophic cardiac myopathy. Uh, that's, that's the disease that athletes have that, that uh, is usually undiagnosed, or I guess is always undiagnosed, that, that young usually young men have and, and they die on the high school football field or on the basketball court and it, it's due to a enlarged septum and, and problems with 
outflow obstruction and subsequent dysrhythmias in the heart. So this is the same thing that kills young athletes all the time, but airmen get it too. Uh, we once were uniformly uh, strict about disqualifying anyone that had this hypertrophic cardiac myopathy, but just like heart transplants, we've developed uh, or been able to identify a subset of folks that we can safely certificate that has this condition. And lastly, I want to talk about some really good news. Uh, for some time, we've been working on a program called FAA MedExpress. Uh, and just last Monday, we actually put this online and made this available to airmen on the West Coast. So right now, it's, it's, it's just Western Pacific, Northwest Mountain, Alaska, that we are allowing airmen to, to use this. But I feel sure that by the time we're here next year, FAA MedExpress will be available to all of us. But basically, FAA Medical Express allows any airman to go online, and this is the screen that you would see online, the first screen that you would see. You go online and you electronically complete your 8500 TAC-8. And there's some passwords involved because we have to protect medical privacy and things of that nature, but it's been beta tested and it's, it's now in active use and we have already had hundreds of aviators on the West Coast that have uh, told us that this is even, uh, this is easy enough to use that even fighter pilots can figure it out. So we're very, we're very excited about this. Uh, basically you fill out all the information, you fill it out at home, in your pajamas where you have your medical records available. You can look at the names of the prescriptions you're taking. You can look at the, the necessary information that you might not remember to carry with you to the AME's office. So you fill this out. You electronically submit it. And here you can see this is, this is basically what the form looks like, an electronic version of the 8500. Um, you, you, you're given a confirmation number. You then show up at your AME's office. He punches the confirmation number into the computer, pulls up the exam you've completed, goes over the history with you, completes the physical, fills in the back of the 8500 TAC-8, and sends it off. And there's no paperwork involved. It's a done deal. Now at present, at present, because of the rules requiring uh, the wording that we have on the back of the medical certificates you actually receive, the AMEs are going to have to, to tear up a paper form that you're used to and use the number and the actual medical certificate that comes on that form. But once we go through OMB and, and have everyone agree on the, on the wording that we can use, on a folded certificate, the next great thing we're going to be able to do, and this is for AMEs, not particularly for airmen, is just have our AMEs print out right there your certificate. So the front will look just like what you're used to when you leave the AMEs office, and the back will have that stuff on it that, that I never read, but we're required to have in terms of periodicity and things of that nature. So this, we feel, is a quantum leap forward. Uh, you'll see lots of, you may not be able to see it, but, but on most every field of the history, there's a question mark. And if you click on this as you are filling out this form, you will be taken to our AME guide, and you will be able to read specifically what we are looking for in terms of history of unconsciousness or history of heart disease or history of, of whatever, we link you immediately to the AME guide and we, uh, we like to think that this is a user-friendly customer satisfaction instrument and I look forward to your comments about FAA MedExpress uh, this time next year. Here's some more good news. <clears throat> After 
working for the past couple of years, we now have an NPRM, Notice for Proposed Rulemaking, on the Federal Register. So if, if you wish to provide comment, you can go online and, and, and tell us what you think, but we, after looking at the medical literature, feel that we can safely certificate um, airmen under the age of 40 much less frequently than we have in the past. For first class pilots, if you're under the age of 40, we're going to go from six months to one year. For third class, if you're under the age of 40, rather than have a medical and a physical every three years, we are willing to go every five years. And that's going to save you folks a lot of money. It's going to save us a lot of time. But we have the scientific data to show that if you're under age 40, you're just not likely to suffer those sudden or subtly, subtly incapacitating illnesses that we're so concerned about in aviation medicine. So we think this is a win-win situation. Uh, if, you, if you like the idea of, uh, of getting a physical list frequently, please go online to the Federal Register and tell us so. Um, lastly, I want to mention something that, that typically always comes up at forums such as this. Uh, we have an antidepressant medication working group, and I can tell you that my boss, Dr. Fred Telton, is very serious about the fact that that he is willing to certificate airmen that are properly diagnosed and treated uh, and are on antidepressants for the most part in a category of SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Um, these antidepressants compared to the old antidepressants are much safer. They're are other countries, including uh, Canada and Australia, that already certificate a subset of airmen on SSRIs. Uh, SSRIs are very commonly used. Every time I go to speak at a forum like this or every time I talk to AMEs, I am always taken aside out in the hallway and told, you know, Doc, I know of a pilot that's taken this and he ain't telling you. And of course, the even worse scenario are those pilots that are clinically depressed, but because they know that FAA rules prohibit the taking of antidepressants and flying an airplane, uh, they're not taking anything. And, and, that, and that too is, uh, is, is something that, that concerns us. So we're looking at a subset of people that are depressed, and of course we have to we have to rule out those cases of depression that are associated with suicidality or, or psychosis. Uh, and then we have to look at the class of SSRIs, and, and some are sedating and certainly are proven to interfere with cognitive processes, something not good when you're flying an airplane. But there's others that are less sedating and are less likely to uh, interfere with these cognitive processes. So we are seriously working on developing the protocol that will allow some airmen to, uh, to fly on SSRIs. And I will tell you, one of the big problems that we have is that our concept of what we allow in the FAA is somewhat different than what most certificating authorities allow. In Europe and in, in many places of the world, they'll take things such as depression uh, or, or heart disease, and they'll restrict the pilot to a multi-pilot crew, which seems to make sense. But we in the U.S., we in the FAA, for a long time, have always considered ATPs, commercial pilots, to be those that we most highly regulate. We, we feel the American public, I'm sure the American public, expects our ATPs to be free of serious potentially suddenly or subtly incapacitating diseases. There are times in two pilot aircraft during critical phases of flight 
that two pilots are there for a reason. So we hold our first class pilots to the highest standards and we allow pilots with third class medical certificates to fly to have to fly with some degree of risk. For instance, uh, the diabetics own, own insulin. Uh, most of the certificating authorities think we're crazy for allowing that in single pilot aircraft. Uh, and the, so, the same, so the same concept works here. Uh, many of the countries that now allow SSRIs or antidepressants are only allowing it in multi-piloted aircraft and that, that is a concept that's diametrically opposed to the concept we hold at the FAA, whereby our third class pilots we allow to fly with conditions that might be somewhat more risky than those that we allow our first class air transport pilots to fly with. But stay tuned, I, I am convinced that someday, hopefully next year, I will be able to come before you and tell you that we have a subset of, of, of depressed pilots that have been followed and our own medication and we allow to fly. <clears throat> I want to touch on just a few other issues and I won't spend a long time on these, uh, but certainly this is an audience where some of you may fly or be interested in flying light sport aircraft. And here are the operational limits for a light sport aircraft. Uh, I bring this up because since we've had the, the rule in Part 61 of CFR regarding the fact that you just need a U.S. driver's license to fly sport pilot, there has been an issue with those folks that have been denied a medical in the past. And of course the rule, the statutory law states that if, if for any reason you applied for an FAA medical certificate and you were denied, suspended, or revoked, you cannot use your driver's license to fly. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to state right now that I realize potentially there is some unfairness in this. There could be twin brothers that have had bipolar disorder one brother applies for an FAA medical certificate and he's denied. The other brother never applies for an FAA medical certificate. He thinks he's just fine. He hadn't been on medicine for a long time. His doctor tells him he's just fine. He goes and, and uh, purchases a light sport aircraft and flies with his driver's license. So I, I admit there's inequality there. I'll state that right up front. However, the lawyers have repeatedly pointed out to us that by law, we as, as government service, as regulatory physicians, are required to act on information that we are aware of. So if we are aware that someone has a psychiatric or a medical illness that is disqualifying, uh, you are not allowed to fly with your driver's license. However, the good news is there are many pilots out there that had heart disease that we used to deny regularly and now we authorize special issuance for these folks on a very regular basis. Uh, cancer is another case that was, was formerly uh, frequently uh, denied. We now routinely allow people to fly with, an auth with a special issuance. So if, if you were denied 10 years ago for a medical condition, uh, please consider reapplying for that medical certificate if you want to fly sport pilot. We are a kinder and gentler FAA than we once were. And lastly, I want to close uh, on, on something that you're all aware of. Um, you know that ICAO on November 23rd instituted their age 65 rule whereby they allowed by ICAO, by ICAO rules if you you can be a pilot over the age of 60 under the age of 65 and fly into this country because we are an ICAO participant uh, if the other pilot 
is under the age of 60. Of course, our FAA rules, and it's not a medical rule, but our FAA rules existent from 1959 say that if you're an air transport pilot the day you reach age 60, you can no longer fly. So once again, there is great inequality in that people that are in other countries uh, that don't fly in registered aircraft can fly into this country over the age of 60, whereas our own U.S. pilots, once they turn 60, they are no longer allowed to fly a, in the U.S. or in an in-registered aircraft that comes and goes into the United States. Um, after convening an advisory rulemaking committee that, that Dr. Tilton and I got to participate in, um, we made recommendations to the FAA administrator and she announced on January 30 that she was instituting a notice of proposed rulemaking. This is quite a complex process which involves lots of lawyers and lots of economists, but but the administrator has committed to posting this NPRM to the Federal Register by September of this year, which is when her term in office will expire. So I know there are people that are very adamantly for this. There's people that are very adamantly against this, but we medicine uh, have taken the position in the advisory rulemaking committee that age in and of itself should not be the determinant of when a pilot can maintain his first class medical. So, so more to follow on that. Um, I will tell you rulemaking is a long involved process. It's certainly been a learning experience for me. Um, there's, there's a couple of things in life a man shouldn't have to watch. One of them is the making of sausage and the other is rulemaking in Washington, D.C. Uh, it is, it is going to be a long, convoluted process, but, uh, but we are serious about proceeding and becoming consistent with ICAO and allowing our air transport pilots to fly beyond the age of 60 up until 65 with the same, with the same rules that the other pilot be under the age of 60. So I could go on and talk about some of the research that neither proves nor disproves the fact that pilots over the age of 60 are safe uh, or any other topic that you wish, but I think it's time to, to pause and take any questions. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm uh, on the medication list after 20 years uh, from MI. Cabbage back in 86. Uh, I understood, you know, that soon the AMEs would be able to do this. Now last year when they renewed me, they didn't grant me that reason, that uh, uh, ability. A -A -A yeah. yeah. Uh, is, is there some reason for this? Is there a subset there as you refer to? Well, Richard may be able to help me out here, but I know if you, if you had an authorization that we said was good for three years, or whatnot. If you already had a piece of paper that said every year we want to send, we want you to send this information to CAMI, or we'll look at it, and then if it looks okay, we'll send a letter back to you that you take to your AME, and he gives you your certificate. We weren't we weren't going to take any existing contract that we had with you and create it uh, or or give you an AASI. We were going to wait and and give you a new a new contract, so to speak. Is that correct, Richard? The most complex cases we're considering for AASI are the so-called quick cert, are the cardiac cases, such as uh, history of bypass, stent, and so on and so forth. The Certification Division in Oklahoma City, which is a branch office of the Federal Air Service Office that reviews these in a special cardiac unit, automatically review every airman's case with a history of cardiac conditions for consideration of the AASI. That's automatically done and in all new letters being sent out to airmen, we specifically address to them, usually in block form, highlighted, bold lettering in there, that you were considered for quick cert for your cardiac condition. 
and specifies if that was not able to be done. Typically the reason for that is that as you know for cardiac conditions one of the key requirements is a follow-up stress test. If that stress test is in some way more complex, more difficult to interpret than is many times the case, then we reserve those more complex cases only for the cardiac unit or the federal air surgeon's cardiologist to review. If the stress test appears to be more routine, uh, more easily observed to be normal to the casual physician observer, then we do try to delegate those cases for quick cert because that allows the AME to do these annual medical reviews and issue the certificate to delay certification for, to minimize delay in certification for the airman. I would think that the nature of the question he was asking would be related to the, the mo more complex cardiac cases. Did that help? Yeah. Uh, and, and, I might, and I might state that, that we are, Richard and the uh, regional flight surgeon from Southern Region, Walt Davis, are going to be here the rest of the week. Uh, and I'm going to be here the rest of the day, so if, if there's any questions that you would like to ask about a particular uh, medical condition, I would, I would suggest that uh, you come to the booth, which is just next door here, and uh, we have the capability to look at the electronic version of your record and uh, get back with you with some, some real-time news, unlike the old days where we just had to take your name and number and say we'll, we'll get back with you. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, Dr. Fraser, I have a question regarding uh, sport uh, pilots. Uh, there are restrictions on the type of airplanes weight or performance for sport pilots. Are these restrictions based on medical decision or medical facts? No. Th the operational limits for what constitute a light sport aircraft were developed by flight standards and I could only say that we in medicine were were generally aware that we were looking for an aircraft that generally would fly low and slow. Uh, but, but there is nothing evidence-based uh, or, or scientific speci specific information regarding the numbers they came up with regarding gross weight, speed, stall speed, etc. Re regarding the sport pilot and medical considerations. It's an interesting development that in this newly emerging technology, there are companies that are specifically targeting unique medical situations, for example, disabled. There are newly developed sport aircraft that are developed to specifically meet the FAA standards that are designed at the factory for disabled um, pilots that are interested in flying. This is one of the unexpected but intriguing aspects of the sport pilot program. So in that respect, there will be medical interest in the Air Medical Certification Division regarding these newer types of aircraft where decisions will have to be made regarding medical flight tests. The most intriguing of one of these aircraft is a sport pilot aircraft designed to meet those specific requirements that will allow both the instructor pilot and the student to both be disabled with dual hand controls. A really interesting development. Those cases will come to our attention because we'll have to give a medical flight test approval for, um, in essence, the instructor pilot and the student. Yes, sir. Could, could you address the cycle time? Uh, and the cycle time is measured by what's of interest to pilots, and that is the date of application to the date of award. And uh, put it on the stage of, in March, the, you, the FAA, uh, released uh, a press release saying that that cycle time was now down to 24 days. 
But that followed on the heels of the administrator in uh, at AirVenture last year saying that that time was down to 16 days. So first of all, that improvement obviously is not, not an improvement. And secondly, any of us, any of those in the room who've been through this know that you hardly process a single piece of paper in 24 days. So please address it from the way we view it, the date of application to the date of award. Right, right. And, and certainly that has come up at Oshkosh and comes up in other venues. Uh, we, we have indeed come quantum leaps in terms of more expeditiously processing um, medical certificates that have been deferred. Now, you're probably aware that, that just over 90% of all medical certificates are issued right out of the AME's office. So 90% plus of the airmen leave their AME's office happy campers. But there's another 10% that need that must be deferred to AMCD, and um, we are victims of our own success. Where once we had medical conditions that we that we and everyone else considered uniformly disqualifying, we now are willing to consider most anything short of a seizure disorder or bipolar disorder or psychosis. I mean, we work hard to get every airman up that we possibly can. And as such, uh, we get some pretty incredibly complex medical and, and psychiatric requests for medical certification. Um, so we're victims of our own success. In order to keep up with this, we convened sessions at CAMI where we would bring in our regional flight surgeons that would, would participate in what we called tiger teams where we'd all get together and work a couple of hundred cases in a week. And now we have the capability to do that electronically with our database system and we have worked very closely training our regional flight surgeons where we have a, have a, have a great resource um, in, in terms of working airman certification cases electronically. And it, it, does, it does wax and wane with the number, but we follow this closely. That's the average number. Certainly, the more complex the case, the more likely you would be to have to wait longer. For instance, if you're an air transport pilot uh, and you have a significant cardiac illness, we convene a cardiology panel. Distinguished cardiologists from all over the country come to CAMI every other month to look at all of the stress tests and the angiograms and all of the testing that we require. So certainly by virtue of the fact that these folks have to wait for a panel, they're going to be on the high end. Um, and I see Richard wants to say something, so I'll stop there and let you chime in, Richard. I think it's important to appreciate in this arena of controversy, obviously I'm the, I'm the place, I'm, at the, I'm the guy where the rubber hits the road. I'm the guy that's making, the, making many of these decisions. Um, there are 400,000 exams coming into Oklahoma, Oklahoma City, and only a few, a few of those actually require a uh, deliberate process of careful medical consideration. However, I think the federal air surgeon, Dr. Tilton, and the deputy federal air surgeon, Dr. Frazier, deserve a great amount of credit in regards to this. There's been significant initiatives being done to expedite this process, one of which is the so-called Quick Cert program where it allows more and more delegated authority. And this was something that AMEs and their pilots have been asking for for a long time. The Federal Air has responded, and Dr. Tilton and Dr. Frazier are both involved in this process, where more and more delegated authority is being allowed to get the AME in the process of doing the exams and helping with the certification. The AMEs can also call us in Oklahoma City and get a verbal authorization to fly to delay this certification process to zero minutes in many cases. So we, in all seriousness, are working very hard to make that wait just as reasonable as possible. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I think we've reached the end of our time. I thank you very much for your attention. That was wonderful. Absolutely wonderful.
Thank you. Thank you.